We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hi, good morning, church. It's uh, great to see everyone here this morning as we kick off our brand new series. We got a lot to cover. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to give you a few highlights uh, from my time away on sabbatical. I put some stats together. Oh, the last one is one of my favorites, but here's some stats. My family, while we were away, we were able to put a, a total of 3,600 miles on a rental car. Uh, visited over 10, over 10 states exactly, not over 10 states. We were in 10 different states, visited four different churches. Here's my, one of my favorite stats, 10 in-and-out burgers. Come on, somebody. That's right. That's, uh, that's worth it right there. Um, one of the things that God continued to show my wife and I and my family while we were away, it just seemed like everywhere we turned, whether we listened, just pop on a random podcast or visit a church and hear a message or read a book to, together as a family or listen to a book in the car, or whatever it was, uh, the story of King David was just... A reoccurring theme. It got to a point where we're like, all right, God, I, we figured it out. You want us to just spend some time and, 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 and focus on this story? And it was just an incredible time. And um, I, I, as I said last week, I had an opportunity to host last week while we were back, but I'm really, really glad that in that time away, not only was it a moment of refreshing and relaxation and all those things, but it was an incredible opportunity for God to continue to just uh, solidify how much um, I love this church. And uh, that's a good thing. You know, sometimes pastors, they go away, and what God communicates to them while they're gone is that that rest and that refreshment that they really need is calling them somewhere else. And man, that was never even a thought in my mind while I was away. It just seemed like every Sunday I was worshiping in another church, and I was thinking, man, I really... I'm excited about this experience, but I wish I were with my family. And I love you guys. I'm glad to be back. Thank you. Let me just, yeah. Um, uh, let me just say thank you to you for uh, giving my family that opportunity and for, for giving us that time off. That was a really um, precious gift. Um, so we're starting a new series today called The Wander Years. And um, we're going through the book of Exodus. It, we're a seven-week series, mind you, okay? We're going through the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the first four chapters of Joshua. We're going to cover a ton of ground together. We're going to be wandering all over the kind of the beginning part of the New Testament because we have a lot to talk about. But obviously, because we're covering so much ground in, in seven weeks, we're going to have to go through at quite a quick pace. But we want to make sure you, you get the highlights. At ACC, I want to make sure that we have what I would consider a well-balanced diet. Right? We don't want to spend all of our sermon series talking about uh, certain topics or, or just spending a lot of time in the New Testament and no time in the Old Testament. We want to make sure that in a, a year's period of time that we've gone through Old Testament books together. We've gone through New Testament books together. We've gone through some doctrinal things together. We've gone through some topical things together. And at the end of the day, at the end of the year, we can see that our, our balanced diet has been helping us to grow strong in our faith. So, so this series, it, we're going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. And I want to encourage you to grab, grab a copy of your Bible. And if, if you don't have a Bible, grab the one in front of you and write your name in it and take it home with you. But go ahead and open up to Exodus chapter 1, because that's where we're going to start today. We're going to get through the first four chapters of Exodus. The word Exodus, by the way, a little bit of a background story. The word Exodus really is just a fancy word for the word departure. And I want you to understand that Exodus 
in the original Hebrew actually starts with the Hebrew word. Now, if you open up your English version, it doesn't start with this word. But if you go back to the Hebrew, uh, first word in Exodus would be the word and. In other words, Exodus is really just a continuation from Genesis. It's all one story. In fact, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, these first five books of the Bible, were all essentially one book called the Torah. So we're just going to explore a part of, we're kind of jumping into the middle of one big story, even though it's the beginning of one of the books of your Bible, all right? Another thing I want to make sure you understand from a context perspective is that Remember, Genesis, we kind of hear the story of, of, of it kind of end with the story of Joseph, right? And Joseph, we know, was kind of raised to a, a place of prominence within Egypt. He was kind of raised to that number two position and was flourishing. God was blessing him and the, the, the Hebrew people, right? But what we're seeing now is that Moses, is who we're about to be introduced to Moses, Moses was born 300 years after Joseph. Remember, Joseph, second in command, and now Moses. And you're going to see that there's been some drastic changes. We already knew that these changes were coming because if you, you don't turn there, stay in Exodus. But in Genesis 15, there was some prophecy that was said to Abram before his name was changed to Abraham. In Genesis 15, I'll put it up on the screen. It says, the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. So he already knows that the Hebrew people are going to be in Egypt, right? And he says, and they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. And then he says, but I will punish the nation that enslaves them. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. Essentially, what God is saying to Abram, he's saying, listen, at some point in the future, your people, right, are going to be enslaved for this long period of time, and, and just, just know that it, it's going to get better. Can we just all acknowledge that that's essentially the story of the Christian walk? Let me just break it down for you. Hey, Christian, hey, brothers and sisters in Christ, listen, sometimes life is going to be hard, but God's got it. Right? And essentially, that's what he's saying to Abram. And that's what we're going to see here in this story, is that we're all going to experience what we call these days of darkness. We all experience these days that are really hard, and these moments in our life that are tough. And what the prophecy that Abram heard about is, your people are going to experience these days of darkness, but don't worry, because the people who cause it one day, uh, they, they're going to be punished for enslaving you, and your people will experience great prosperity. So we're at about the 300-year-ish mark past this 400-year this prophecy. Joseph is now dead and gone. The Pharaoh that loved Joseph is now dead and gone. And we see the people are now in a very, very different place in Egypt. They're still in Egypt, but it's not like it was under Joseph. In fact, we can see these days of darkness really clearly in Exodus, where you are right now, chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Here's what it says. It says, eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt, who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. And he said to his people, look, the people of Israel are now, out, are now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, notice this, if, 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 how many of you guys are really good at making up stories in the future that haven't even happened yet? If this, if that, uh, some of us, we, we've, we've designed a whole past and a whole future, a past that isn't real, that points to a future that hasn't happened yet, and we mess ourselves up sitting right in the middle of it. And this Pharaoh is saying a whole bunch of if statements. He says, if we don't. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. They will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. So here we are, 300 years later, 
The Israelites have been placed into slavery under a new pharaoh, a new king, and they're entering into experiencing these what I would call days of darkness. Now, let me again acknowledge that we all have experienced days of darkness in our life. Maybe they're days of darkness that you brought on yourself. Maybe they're days of darkness that you had nothing to do with. You know those days of darkness where you kind of have an opportunity to kind of look up to God and say, what, what, why is this happening to me? I didn't bring this on. Why are you allowing this to happen? The Hebrew people must be feeling a lot like this. There's promises that were made to their ancestor, Abraham, and they're thinking, God, what in the world is going on? Why are we experiencing these days of darkness? And Scripture, frankly, doesn't tell us that they brought this on themselves. It just says that there is a Pharaoh who's worried about his power, and he takes the Hebrew people and places them into captivity. So if we're going to get some, some lessons out of these first four chapters, these days of darkness before the exodus, here's the first one I want us to, to, to learn something from is this. Our fear is often our greatest enemy. Our fear is often our greatest enemy. Here's what's going on. The Pharaoh has made up an enemy that doesn't exist. The Pharaoh has is, is, is designed a, a future where the Hebrew people have risen up against him and are, are, are fighting against him. And if they're not fighting against him, they're leaving. And he's decided that both are going to happen. And his fear was actually the enemy that caused him to treat God's people this way. This is how it came across in, in verse 16. It says, when you help the Hebrew, this is what he said to the, uh, the midwives, when you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders they allowed the boys to live too. So the king has made up this, this right? We got to control this population. The Hebrew people are becoming too powerful. So he says to the midwives, every time a baby boy is born, it's now an order, an edict of the Pharaoh, of the king. You must kill all baby boys. Listen, uh, if you know how biology works, if you kill all the boys, you control the population. You know, it's interesting how this ties back to our message from last week as Pastor Mike asked the question or answered the question, how, is it ever okay to do wrong to do right? If someone were to ask me that question, this is one of the places in Scripture I would turn. I mean, we could go to the story of Rahab lying about, you know, hiding some... some Israelites in her home, or we could go to this story right here. The Hebrew, the midwives were told, if there is a baby boy, you are by order of the king to kill him. But it says the midwives and the parents, they feared God and they disobeyed the orders and lied. In fact, in Hebrews, right, there's a chapter that we call the chapter, the hall of faith. And the, the parents and the, the midwives in this account are actually, it's attributed to them as faith that they disobeyed these orders and lied about their reason for not killing these, these Hebrew boys. You think about some of those questions, is it ever okay to do wrong to do right? As Pastor Michael pointed out last week, right, there are greater commandments. What are the two greatest commandments? To love God and to love God. People. So if there are greater commandments, then we can infer, right, that there are lesser commandments. And if God has gone out of his way to put the commandments in some sort of priority order, another thing we can learn from that, right, is simply this, is that there are going to be times where you are going to have to choose a higher priority command over a lesser priority command. There are going to be times where you're in an ethical dilemma and you have to decide, am I going to do this or am I going to do that? Where two commands are essentially pitted against each other. And as Michael pointed out last week, our job is to do the thing that shows the most love. This happens in our lives all the time. You know, when my, my wife was turning 40, uh, I'll tell you, what, about a year ago, I decided to throw her a surprise party. And I will tell you, my wife 
asked me so many times leading up to that surprise party, you're not throwing me a surprise party, right? And guess what I did? I lied right to my wife. <laughs> Put her right in the face. Oh, no. So I like, listen, I need you to promise me that you're not throwing me a surprise party. Sweetheart, I'm not throwing you a surprise party. And I threw her a surprise party. <laughs> and it was, it was great. And you ask, well, how, how, do you, how do you get around that? You lied. The Bible's really clear about this. Well, there's, there's something, right, where sometimes you have this option of how do I show the most love in this situation? My lie wasn't coming from a place of selfishness. It wasn't coming from a place of ultimate deceit. It was coming from a place of love. Or, or maybe an example, you, maybe you have a young child who brings you something they, they made up in Kid Point today, and they're going to show it to you and say, Daddy, do you like my drawing? Come on, Mom and Dad. You know you don't care for that drawing. <laughs> but what are you going to say? I love it. This is the best drawing I've ever seen. And you're going to choose to show love. And so these, these midwives, they have to decide, are we going to lie to the king or are we going to murder babies? And they decide to do the thing that shows the most love. And they lie. In fact, as the Pharaoh is asking, why do these boys keep living? They make up this story that sounds something like this. These Hebrew women, they just have, they give birth so fast that by the time we get there, the baby's already born and gone. We can't do anything about it. And so this baby boy is born. The mother hides this baby boy for three months. And then eventually, when the Bible says she couldn't hide her baby anymore, she puts him in a basket and floats him down the river. Now it gets us to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. And the baby's floating down the river, right? And it says, Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she, get this, she felt sorry for him. This must be one of those Hebrew children, she said. Here's another lesson I hope we can glean from this, these days of darkness, and it's this. That God's timing and his provision are always perfect. There's something just perfect about the timing of this story. It says that at three months when the baby can no longer be hidden, you know, babies get louder and start, you know, moving around a whole lot more. And there's there a moment, could that, could that have been one day later? Could it have been one day sooner that, that this baby's mother decides to send this baby? It probably could have been, but God's timing is so perfect that the moment this mother says, this is the time I'm going to put this, I'm not going to kill the baby, I'm going, to, I'm going to float it down. And it just happens that Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, is there and finds this baby. This incredible timing. Can I just pause for a moment and point out a really important truth that still applies to our culture today? There's something incredibly powerful about seeing a baby in recognizing the sanctity of life. It's one of the reasons we support the pregnancy, the local pregnancy clinic and their sonogram ministry. One of the most powerful ways you can support life from conception is essentially give moms an opportunity to see their baby. Give them a 3D ultrasound and allow them to see a baby. Pharaoh's daughter says, saw this baby and immediately felt sorry. She recognized that there was life, and she couldn't take it. And so Pharaoh's daughter names this baby Moses. One of the great champions of our faith is named in this moment. You know, the name Moses means saved out of the water. This baby, and again, we're going to speed ahead, all right? This baby grows up. And at 40 years old, Moses knows, most likely because he's circumcised, knows that he really kind of belongs more with the Hebrew people 
than with the, the royal people that have raised him. And he, he kind of knows where he fits in, and he sees his people one of uh, being abused and beaten by an Egyptian, and he steps in and ends up, the Egyptian ends up being killed. Moses tries to hide it, but the Pharaoh finds out, and Moses runs away. And on his run away, he stops by this well. Uh, listen, don't, don't miss all of the ways that God's timing and provision are always perfect in this story. He's in the right place. He, he, he ends up killing. There's another person who just happens to see. Pharaoh gets the, the word. Moses runs. And then Moses ends up at this well where there's the seven daughters of the priest of Midian. And he has an opportunity in that moment also to, to do this gentlemanly deed. The daughters tell their dad about how Moses kind of came and, and protected and fed their sheep and gave, draw, drew water for them. And, and the, the priest of Midian says, I want you to, to marry one of my daughters. He ends up with a wife. But see, in this story, one thing you're going to notice is over and over and over again, there's examples of God and his timing being perfect. God and his provision being perfect perfect. I think that if you look at your own life, you'll be able to find those moments where you see God did something. He walked you through a day of darkness, maybe a whole season or years of darkness. And, and sometimes we have this benefit of being able to look back and seeing exactly what God was doing and why he did that and why his timing and provision was so beautiful. The account that I like to share the most, and some of you have heard this story, so bear with me, but Probably the darkest season of my life, right? Sophomore in high school, I get called out of class and told that my mom passed away that morning of a heart attack, completely out of the blue. I watched as my church, remember Rick Countryman was here maybe seven weeks ago, my youth pastor at the time. Watched how he and the other youth pastors of our church came and supported me and supported our family and watched how the church just kind of went into this, this, this mode of loving on me and my family. And I remember how God used that experience to, to the point where I had a conversation with Rick, and I said, Rick, I feel like God is calling me into ministry. This is not an experience I would have had if my mom were still living. I already had other plans for my life. Rick said, you know, I want to, um, if, if you really feel called into ministry, I want to pay for you to fly out to, to Virginia to check out a school. I really wish he would have said, I want to pay for you to go to school in Virginia. <laughs> but he said, I want you to go visit and I'll pay for it. And I ended up at, at Liberty where I met my wife. I had already really put a deposit down to get this really great scholarship at Biola University, but I went to Liberty, ended up at Liberty, met my wife three beautiful children. I mean, I just, you can trace these things back, these blessings back to this day of darkness where my mom's life was taken unexpectedly, unfairly. I remember saying, God, why? Why are you pulling me through this season? What did I do? But now I look back and in a really, really weird, I promise not a twisted way, I'm really thankful that God took my mom She's in heaven, by the way, which makes it so much greater. You know, um, so this story goes on. The Pharaoh that was chasing after Moses dies, and a new Pharaoh is installed. And it says in Exodus 2, verse 23, it says, Years passed, and the king of Egypt died. The king of Egypt is just, uh, if you're in the NLT, it's going to say king. In other versions, you might have the word Pharaoh it says that the Pharaoh died, and the Israelites continued to groan under the burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. So essentially what we are is we're getting closer to that 400-year mark now. We're getting closer to that point where God had told Abram, listen, your people are going to be living under this, this oppressive slavery situation for, for 400 years. We're getting closer to that mark, and the people are crying out to God. 
Now, now mind you, Moses is no longer part of this situation. He's now living somewhere else, minding his own business. He's got a wife. He's not living under the oppression of, of the Pharaoh. And here's what it says in chapter 3. It says, one day Moses was out tending his flock. He just, I like to put the word just in there. He was just out doing his own thing. He's minding his own business. The flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock into the wilderness and came to Sinai. He's going to come back there at some point in the future. The mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Now, you've probably heard this story. Maybe if you've been to Sunday school or a VBS or a Kid Venture just a few times in your life, you've probably heard the story of Moses and the burning bush. Well, here it is in Exodus 3. It goes on in verse 3. It says, this is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. And when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. See, God identified himself then, as you keep reading, as the father of his ancestors, and Moses responds reverently. But here, here's the next point I want to make sure you understand in this. Some of you might find yourself right now in a day of darkness. Some of you are experiencing it right now. Some of you aren't experiencing a day of darkness right now. Moses, his people are in Egypt experiencing days of darkness, but Moses is over somewhere else minding his own business. He's not living under the oppressive rule of the Pharaoh at the moment, and he's not living in days of darkness. But here's the thing I want to make sure you know is you might be the light in someone else's darkness. There might be someone right now who's living in a season of darkness and they're praying for rescue, they're praying for help, they're praying for some sort of light in their darkness and God might decide that you, that I, that one, you know, one of us in this room, that we're going to be the answer to their darkness. It says that God hears the Hebrews' cries and that he's going to choose Moses to be the answer. In fact, this is what it says in verse 10. It says, he says to Moses, now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. <laughs> Get this. Hey, you, Moses, you're minding your own business. You're not living in a day of darkness right now. I'm going to send you back into the place of darkness, and you are going to be the answer for the people crying out to me. Can I just point out something real fast? First of all, I want to make sure that you know, when it says that God remembered the promise he made to Abraham, God never forgot the promise he made to Abraham. What that word really means is that he knew in this moment that it was time to act, that that 400-year prophecy, that there was time to start moving on that. And then he calls Moses. Let me point this out. Sometimes you might think that there was just this bush that was on fire and the very next person to walk by it was the one who was going to be called to do this work. That's not at all what's happening here. This bush on fire was very specifically meant to be seen by Moses. God is not lost. He chooses Moses to be the answer, to be the light in someone else's darkness. You see all throughout this passage, especially when you look at verses like 7 through 10 of chapter 3, it says that their cries, it doesn't say Moses' cries, right? It says them, not you. This whole time, in fact, if you look at verse 8, I'll just give you a short example of this. It says, so I have come down, this is God talking to Moses. He says, so I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians, and to lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. What he's saying to Moses is, listen, they're the ones in darkness. They're the ones with the problem, but I'm sending you to help. 
Another little side note. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to not worry about other people's problems when you don't know they're there? There's that phrase that we like to say, right? Ignorance is bliss. If, if you don't have to worry, you don't have to worry about other people's problems if you don't know that anybody else has any problems. If you ever ask, you don't ever travel. I and mean, one of the best ways to experience and see the true need in the world and how God might be calling you into it is just to go and see it for yourself. To be willing to open up your eyes to the needs and the darkness of the people around you. And listen, it's, I, I promise you, it's so much easier just to keep your eyes closed because then you don't have to get uncomfortable. But when you choose to open up your eyes, you choose to walk across the street, you choose to go to the cubicle across the way, you choose to get in a plane and travel to a country on the other side of the world, what you are going to see is other people's darkness and other people's needs and other people's hurts and other people's struggles. And when you see it, it's really hard to ignore. And that's why most of us like to keep our eyes closed, unfortunately. So here's another little freebie, number four. God will show up in powerful ways. One of the things we see God do here is he shows up in a, a fire in a burning bush, right? This bush that's on fire, it's not being consumed. Moses is amazed, it gets his attention. I think that if you were out in the wilderness distracted with a job to do, it would be easy to miss if God was trying to get your attention. But man, you take a bush and you set it on fire in the middle of the wilderness, it's going to grab your attention, isn't it? When we were flying to California and back as a family for our sabbatical, I brought, um, I downloaded some movies on my phone before we left so I could watch some movies and I, I brought noise-canceling headphones right? So you get yourself in a situation, your family's all kind of sitting on both sides of you, and I, I put the noise-canceling headphones on, I put my movie on, and every once in a while, <laughs> what? Someone, you know, someone's trying to get a hold of me. You're going to have to, you're going to have to slap me, essentially, if you're trying to get my attention, because I can't hear you. I'm in my own world. I got my eyes down. I got my ears. I'm literally canceling out the noise, and what God says is, listen, if I want to get your attention, I might slap you across the head. If you're not paying attention, God will get your attention. And that's what he does here for Moses. He sets a bush on fire. And Moses notices God will show up in powerful ways. But what, here's what happens. God tells Moses, right, I want to use you. And then Moses does this thing where he says, <laughs> no, not me. You can certainly, you certainly, Moses tries to talk God out of using him. Look at it in verse 11. It says, Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? I'm sure this has happened to you before as well. Last night, I was at a Phillies game with one of my closest friends and my family. Uh, they were playing the Cubs in Philadelphia, and we were there. And at one point, I looked up behind me, and the moment I looked, I see three people <laughs> waving in my direction. I'm like, do I know these people? <laughs> and you know what you do, right, in that situation? Sometimes... Right, we make the wrong decision and we wave back. And there's a real awkward moment of why is that guy waving back at me? I don't know him. So I'm thinking, I don't know if I know them. I'm not gonna wave, I'm gonna look the other direction. Certainly they're waving at someone else, right? Moses walks up to this situation. God says, I'm gonna send you, Moses. You're gonna be the guy. And I'm sure Moses was like, me? Who am I? Why in the world would you send me? There's all sorts of other people out there. Why, God, you, I'm sure he kept checking behind him. Certainly there's someone hiding behind a rock, and God is talking to them. You know, I totally understand this experience when this church, about five and a half years ago now, asked me to serve as a lead pastor. I remember the elders at the time, our, our overseers, called me into a meeting and they said, you know, our lead pastor is retiring. We want to ask you to step into this role. 
And one of the things I did in that moment was, uh, there was a couple things on my list, but I'm like, hey, would you just give me a little bit of time to put together a document that essentially tries to talk you out of this? I want to put together a document that says, here's the reasons why I would make a terrible lead pastor. And I want to just be full disclosure with you. I want to tell you some of my weaknesses, some of my struggles, some of the things I'm going through. And if at the end of the day, you can read through that and I haven't changed your mind, then, then maybe we'll, we'll move forward. And Moses is doing the same thing. He's like, let me, God, can I just tell you real quick why I would be a terrible person for this job? But here's the fifth thing I want to make sure we all, we all learn together today, is that God always qualifies those he calls. God always qualifies those he calls. Now, in your day of darkness, the way it might, it, you might be experiencing this day of darkness, maybe God's asking you to do something, and you're thinking, I don't have any experience doing this. There are so many people that are more qualified for this job than I am. You're asking me to do something that's not in my wheelhouse, it's not in my giftedness, it doesn't match my personality. This certainly would be something that would make me really uncomfortable. And, and we essentially say, God, I am not qualified. But if this is true, that God always qualifies those, he's going to listen to this. You know that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. When God asks you to do something, he will always then qualify you to be able to do the thing that he's asking you to do. It doesn't matter what your gift sets are. You know, one of the things I tried, right, with the overseers at the church, I said, listen, when they hired me for this job, even uh, the, the job before this job, which was the pastor of family ministries, I was 34 years old at the time. I had never been to seminary. I wasn't ordained, and I had zero pastoral ministry experience in the church. And then I felt like God was calling me to go into ministry. I'm like, I'm 34. It's, it's kind of late to switch a career into a place where, listen, the church has since ordained me, but I still have very little experience, probably less experience than the rest of our pastoral staff. I still haven't been to seminary. And that God reminds us over and over again, listen, I don't, I don't just call the qualified. I qualify those I call. And when I call you, I will qualify you to be able to do the thing I'm asking you to do. And he has this conversation with Moses and it says, God answers, I will be with you. Notice in verse 11, he's saying, Moses saying, who am I? Who am I? I, 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 I. And God says, enough about you. God says, I will be with you. This is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought your people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. I'm sure in that moment, Moses looks around again. Certainly now the guy that the, the bush is talking to, right, is now standing there. And he looks around and he's like, I, I, who should I tell people you are exactly? And then God says this, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. God says, tell them I am has sent me to you. Now, to us, that might just sound like bad grammar. But this name, I am, it actually means something. It's an ancient name for God, which literally means, I have always been what I will always be. Or I have always been what I will always be. It's another way of saying that he is this self-existent one. Uh, really, uh, the way I like to put it is when God says that he is the I am, what he's really saying is, this, all creation depends on me, and I depend on no one. He tells Moses, all creation depends on me. I don't, I don't depend on you, Moses. I don't need you. I don't need your gifts. But it shows in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Moses protested again. <laughs> I love how it just starts. All right, so this is like number two or three times Moses said, this is like, the, I think, the third time, Moses, wait, Moses protests again, and essentially what he says is, what if they don't believe me? You tell me that you're sending me, and you tell me what to say, but what if I go and I say that, and they don't believe me when I tell them what you told me to say? And so God gives them 
God gives Moses some signs. He says, listen, if you take this staff and show them, and you put it on the ground, it'll turn into a snake. And then when you pick it back up, it'll turn back into a staff. That'll do it. He says, and then here, Moses, take your hand, because Moses is still protesting. He's like, put it in your cloak. So he puts it in his cloak, and he pulls it out, and it comes out diseased and leprous. He says, all right, put it in your cloak again. He puts it in and pulls it back out, and it's healthy again. He says, if the snake thing doesn't work, that will show them. He's like, but God, what if they still don't believe me? This is Moses doing everything he can to talk himself out of this job. And God says, listen, they still don't believe you. Pour some water out on the ground and it'll turn into blood. Then certainly they will believe that you have the power of God behind you. You ready? Number four, Moses protests again. Come on, Moses. Chapter four, verse 10, it says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord. We like to, to pick on Moses in this moment. He keeps protesting. Can you imagine if God called you to do something as hard as he was calling Moses to do, especially if you felt unqualified for the job? I get it. I think I'd probably protest a bunch of times too. And now Moses gives a real practical reason why he's the wrong guy for the job. He says, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been. And I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. I love what he says. I, I was bad with words before a burning bush showed up, before I was speaking to God. And now uh, God is having a conversation with me. I'm a hot mess, is what he's saying. I am not the guy to go and do this. But do you remember what I am means, right? I am means Moses all creation depends on me. I don't depend on you. I don't need you. I don't care whether or not you can speak. In fact, he, let, me, let me just be real honest with everyone in this room. You ready for this? Hopefully you don't feel hurt by this. God doesn't need you. Whatever it is that he wants to do today, whatever purpose he has for this world today, he's going to accomplish it with or without you. He doesn't need you. He loves you and wants you to be a part of what he's doing. So he allows you to be a part of the story that he's writing. But if you just say, God, nope, I've written myself out of this chapter. He's going to accomplish what he was going to accomplish without you. He doesn't need you. And he says this to Moses. The, the Lord says or asks Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? It, is it not I, the Lord? Now Go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. In other words, I will be the one, Moses, speaking through you. Again, I am means all creation depends on me, Moses. I don't, I don't need you. I'm going to speak through you. Thousands of years from now, people are going to write and read stories about how I used you. But I'm going to do the talking. Verse 13, but Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send someone else. Like what, six or something times here? I love this phrase, Lord, please send anyone else. How little confidence do you have to have to literally think that any person alive in that moment can do the job better than you? That's where Moses is at in his heart. God, literally, send anybody else. You know that, that I passed some little children, you know, on the way. You just send them. I passed somebody who, you know, whatever. I send that person. I send whatever. He's saying, God, send anybody else. Anybody else can do this better than I can. And God says to Moses, I'm paraphrasing here, enough excuses, Moses. And then he, he really points out, if you have some weaknesses, that's all right. You can delegate. You got a brother named Aaron. He speaks really well. But I'm going to use you. You can gather up some people. You can get some resources that I've put around you. You can utilize the, the gifts I've given to you. In fact, this is number six. You ready for this? It is okay to lean on other people in your weaknesses. 
You find yourself being called into something and you just go at it and you realize along the way that there's some things that God is purposely just not strengthening. These are some areas of weakness for you. That's fine because what God's gonna do when he qualifies those he calls, sometimes what he does is he gives you the strength to do that thing that you were weak at. Sometimes he just says, no, you're weak at that, but I'm gonna provide so-and-so to come alongside you and help. And what he says is your brother Aaron, he's coming. He's really good at speaking. In fact, I want to encourage you to utilize the people and resources God has provided to you for this purpose or for the purposes he has given to you. So to wrap up chapter four, Moses eventually heads back to Egypt. He's got his brother with him. It's now safe there. There's no computer keeping track of the arrest warrant for him. That would have been a nice thing back in the day. You know, you're guilty of something, just disappear for a few years and come back and nobody remembers. Moses heads back to Egypt where it's now safe for him and Moses and Aaron go and they communicate to the Israelites exactly how God asked them to. And I'm not gonna give you the rest of the story because we got six more weeks of our series together. But we always end with this question of what now, God? What do we do when we find ourselves in days of darkness? What do we do when the people around us are in days of darkness? God, what is it that you want us to do? Can I point out something? Remember point number two reminded us that God's timing and his provision are always perfect. You know something really cool about this story, about God's timing? Let me point this out real quick. In chapter four, verse 14, God says to Moses, hey, your brother Aaron is on his way already. Remember that. And then if you skip forward to verse 27, God then goes to Aaron and says, Aaron, I need you to go. She's like, wait, you already told Moses that Aaron was already on his way, and now a few verses later, some days have gone by, now you're telling Aaron to get up and go and help his brother Moses. Which one was it? Did he tell, was Aaron already on his way, or did he have to tell Aaron to go on his way? And, and ultimately, let me tell you this, God is outside of time and space. If you're celebrating a birthday today, God is not only celebrating this birthday, he's celebrating the next one and the last one at the same time. God's outside of all this. He knows exactly what everybody needs and the timing of everything to make sure everyone shows up at the right place at the right time to accomplish his purpose. And when he's saying that Aaron's already on his way, what he's saying is there's already a plan that's gonna get Aaron at the exact right place at the right time to help you with this, Moses. Another way we see God's timing being so beautifully perfect, remember the Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses in the water. And what does she name him? Moses, right? Moses, which means saved out of the water. Now, Pharaoh's daughter has no idea the double meaning that she just named her son. She saved him out of some water. But God is going to do some work in the next few weeks of our study where we're going to see Moses saved out of water in a whole different way. See, God knows a bigger picture than we could ever understand. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Our what now, God, this morning is I'm going to put six prayers up on the screen. And I want you to pick the one that God's maybe calling you to, to pray this morning. The first one is maybe this. They all kind of go with our six points. Number one is God, help me to have faith, not fear. Maybe you're struggling with fear this morning. And you just need to ask God to give you more faith than fear. Maybe it's this, God, help me to trust your timing. Maybe it's, God, help me to help those who are hurting around me. Maybe you find yourself really comfortable this morning and your, your eyes are closed and you don't really want to pay attention to the pain that's happening around you. And maybe you're just asking, God, will you open my eyes and show me who, are, who those are that are hurting and give me the courage to go help them. How about this one? God, get my attention if I am too distracted right now in hurt or pride to hear how you're leading me in my life. Maybe you just aren't really sure what God's calling you into next. Listen, if you're not sure where God's calling you and what the next step is for your faith, it's probably because you're distracted by hurt or pride and you're not paying attention. You need God to hit you over the head and show you something. Maybe it's this, God, help me to do 
what only you can do through me. And then I would encourage you to do that thing with courage. Or how about this one? God, help me to lean on you and others when and where I need help. Maybe your pride has you in a place right now where you're trying to get through something on your own when God has placed people and resources next to you and he's given you access to them and you just need some direction. So here's what I want to do. We don't always do this at ACC and I only want to ask you to do this if you're physically able to do it. If you're not physically able to do this, don't. But I want you to pick one of those prayers and I want to invite you onto your knees this morning. And we're just going to give you a moment to pray that prayer. You can put it in your own words, but I want to ask you to pray that prayer over your own life. So wherever you are, if you're physically able, would you get on your knees, face your chair, whatever position makes sense for you, and pray that for me. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.